Uh, today I'll be talking specifically about uh, our program's experience using games and immersive technologies in perioperative and pain medicine, uh, primarily for children, but uh, we work with adults. That's we call them big children. Uh, I have no financial disclosures for myself. Uh, our program does receive funding from a variety of sources. Uh, some three takeaway points is that uh, when you're working in healthcare, especially when you're working with uh, children and actual patients, you need multiple different tools, whether they're uh, delivery methods or uh, software, types of software, uh, which I call content uh, for different personalities, age groups, and clinical situations. Uh, we've shown and have a lot of experience uh, with immersive technology is actually decreasing or replacing pharmacologic interventions in some situations. And uh, I never want people for, to forget, especially if you are someone who is delivering uh, care to patients, that uh, the clinician-patient relationship is crucial to the success of, of anything we do uh, relating to games or distraction or, or any sort of therapy, that, whether it's immersive technologies or games or, or whatever we're doing. Um, my primary role is as a, as a clinical, as a clinician, as a pediatric anesthesiologist. I deal with kids who need to have procedures, uh, families that are very nervous, and uh, my goal is to get them through safely and comfortably, uh, whether that's with or without uh, pharmacologic intervention, meaning uh, medications by mouth, IV medications, uh, or general anesthesia where they're completely asleep for a procedure. Uh, to help do this, uh, elegantly and get kids through procedures with dignity and self-respect rather than holding them down for every procedure. Um, we start off pretty simply, just kind of creating stuff in, in my garage and, and anesthesiologists are very resourceful. They're always coming up with new games and techniques to get uh, people pr through procedures uh, safely and comfortably, but we kind of formalize things by creating the Chariot Program at Stanford, which, the, which used to stand for Childhood Anxiety Reduction Through Innovation and Technology. Uh, the acronym was kind of complicated. We started doing much more stuff with pain and some stuff for adults. So we got rid of the acronym and, and it's kind of just known as the Chariot Program now. Uh, we also created a nonprofit called Invincikids.org to help distribute some of the software and hardware modifications that we were creating at Stanford. Stanford to uh, uh, other partner institutions, academic institutions, and, uh, and now we're starting to distribute uh, nationally and internationally to hospitals that have less resources that can't necessarily afford uh, to develop their own programs or even, even buy their own equipment. Um, here's an example of, of how simply we started in the program. Uh, this was called a blast off induction. So, what you'll see here is the volume. Uh, what you'll see here is a kid who's about to undergo a procedure. Uh, this is simply various videos spliced together to time up with the induction process. Uh, induction of anesthesia would be he's getting a mask. Uh, so if you were to hear the video, it would say it's now time to hook up your space monitors. And you can see the nurse on the side hooking up his monitors, uh, which would be blood pressure, uh, oxygen. Uh, I'm putting on a space mask now, again, which syncs up with the video. And then we do kind of a countdown as he starts to get uh, some anesthesia gases, which would be uh, nitrous oxide initially, which is laughing gas, followed by some stronger anesthetics like sevoflurane. Uh, this was all done in, in iMovie, just splicing stuff together, and this is a, a projection system that we installed to, to help do this on a curtain. Uh, we portableized that system uh, to something called the BERT unit. It stands for Bedside Entertainment and Relaxation Theater. So it's a bed-mounted, battery-powered projector that sits behind the patient, mounted to the bed and projects onto a screen that is mount, mounted to the rail so that we can take movies with the kids as uh, they're being transported through the hallway. Uh, we can play interactive games. This is an interactive game created by uh, a programmer called Joe, named Joe Lang, uh, who we hired to create our original version of Sivo the Dragon. Uh, I think I have a video of that. We got a lot of press for this, including uh, NPR. We got a little spot on the Super Bowl ad, which was regional, because um, 
our hospital really liked this program. This has been used thousands and thousands of times at uh, our hospital and, and there are other hospitals that are now starting to use the BERT system. From that, we grew as a program to start doing more research uh, on efficacy and finding novel ways to uh, uh, treat kids' pain, uh, not just get them through procedures, but working, expanding to chronic pain and physical therapy. Uh, we started developing more software with, with partner uh, developers, uh, designing clinical pro protocols for implementation in our hospital and, and advising other hospitals. And finally, we, we don't build our own hard hardware, but we do build hardware modifications for things uh, like uh, infection control, uh, you know, taking a headset off the shelf and making sure it's durable and infection control uh, uh, approved for the hospital environment. Uh, we believe in having a lot of different tools for uh, taking care of different kids uh, and adults in different clinical situations. Those might be virtual reality, tablets, uh, augmented reality, might just be telling well-timed, age-appropriate jokes. Um, we also talk about something called a spectrum of immersivity when we're trying to develop a, a, or, or decide on a delivery system for a specific patient. Um, some patients want to have no idea what's going on. They don't want to see the needle. Uh, they don't want to know they're in the hospital, and, and they want to be completely immersed, and, and those patients might be a great candidate for virtual reality. There are kids uh, who want to be able to see their parents. They like to uh, uh, be able to see the IV and what's happening to them, and they might be more but better suited for video projection or augmented reality or a tablet. And in some environments, these, these more advanced immersive tools aren't available, and, and we make do with a phone or a tablet. And uh, the delivery system will depend on the clinical environment and the patient themselves. Uh, we're technology agnostic. We'll use whatever we can get our hands on. Uh, right now, we're primarily using, uh, well, we have gear VRs, which are kind of almost completely phased out. Uh, we have a, a collection of Oculus Go's, and, and we're starting to phase in the Quest 2 a little bit more. Uh, for our projection system, we were using the ZTE Spro 2 primarily, which has now been phased out for the Nebula Capsule Max, and we do some hardware modifications for those to make them more durable. Uh, for room scale VR, for physical therapy, uh, we primarily use the HTC Vive and augmented reality. We're trying a bunch of different stuff. Uh, we are currently using the Magic Leap for uh, some of our simulation stuff. Uh, we are not actively using the Mira or Microsoft HoloLens at this time. For, since it's a game conference, I just want to go over the important stuff that we have uh, implemented when designing software for the healthcare environment and for kids. Seems a little bit disorganized, but this is kind of how we uh, came upon uh, a lot of these important concepts that we learned when designing software for the healthcare environment. The most important thing is to do no harm. We can't have kids, patients right before surgery throwing up from being dizzy and nauseous and having you know a procedure they've been waiting for for months and months canceled because now they're vomiting before a procedure. So our primary principle is to do no harm. Um, all of our uh, our games are are, are pretty non-violent uh, compared to what's commercially uh, available. Uh, we do like to give the patients an element of choice. You know, in the hospital, they're in a situation where their autonomy, their decision making uh, ability is very limited to non-existent. So. We like them to be able to choose their own character or customize their character or choose a level, give them some uh, element of uh, control back in the game. Uh, we do a lot, variety of things to make sure it's, it's just for VR uh, as least nauseating as possible. That might be having uh, you know rather a third person viewpoint rather than a first person viewpoint. It uh, might be things like having the uh, user stationary and have ob objects come towards them rather than moving towards them, minimizing rotation. Uh, we do do a lot of stuff in space or underwater, and that's very intentional. It's because we have patients undergoing procedures in a variety of positions. Sometimes they're sitting straight up, sometimes they're laying down, sometimes they're on their side for a procedure. So we need to be able to reorient the game sometimes very quickly uh, in the middle of a procedure if the patient's sitting up and they feel dizzy or woozy or they need to be repositioned for the procedure itself. 
um, we have added the ability to reorient the headset in real time. If you're in space, if you're underwater, you don't have to deal with uh, horizon lines uh, and, and having distortion of the horizon lines causing nausea. So uh, we found that to be very useful. And, uh, you know, having it as simple as possible, we, we, a lot of our uh, facilitators might only use a headset once a week or once a month or once every other month if it's, you know, when they really, really need it. So uh, having it be as simple, simple, simple as possible uh, is something that will, will allow it to be used uh, much, much more. Uh, we've designed a lot of software for a lot of different systems. And uh, here's just some of the examples of games. Uh, I don't know, maybe you guys have seen some of these, like Space Burgers or Sebo the Dragon or uh, Space Pups. That's a cool one. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of uh, a cool element that we've added into some of the games, which is, this is an old video, uh, the ability to adjust the uh, cognitive load. So... I don't know if you were able to see it there, but right as they were putting the needle in, the, the, one of the assistants tapped on the control pad of the headset uh, to put it into a turbo mode. For this, it was called groovy mode in uh, Pebbles the Penguin. And it actually upped the intensity of the game for about 12 seconds, right before we're about to do something very, very stimulating. So this kid was getting a needle in his arm. The intensity of the game actually increased right as uh, the needle was going in, so he had to focus more on the game and there was less, uh, you know, room in his brain to focus on uh, the pain of the needle insertion. This kid actually underwent uh, a hormone implant uh, procedure, which requires an incision, stitches, is about 20 minutes long, and uh, he did it with just virtual reality. This is all data of just some of our usage from the headsets, which we, which we do track uh, periodically. And uh, I don't know, you can see like 3,000 sessions over a year. And uh, I don't know, it's 360 hours. It's a lot of VR time. Um, our projection system, we're always building new stuff for this. This is the old Sivo the Dragon game, um, but we do have a new version that came out uh, probably about a month or two ago for the Nebula Capsule Max. And uh, this is how it would look. A kid, this girl's coming in for, to have a, a kidney biopsy where they're going to stick a big needle into her uh, side or back. Um, we'll give her some sedation for it, but to get her off to sleep, uh, we're going to do a fun game with her. The projector, this is the old projector, is mounted behind her head. In the bottom right corner, you can see what she gets to select. So this is actually a clinician, uh, a clinician controlled game, but we tricked the kid into thinking that they're controlling the game. So uh, she picks the color of her dragon. She picks the type of food that the dragon's going to cook. And... Now, every time she breathes into the mask, um, someone will tap on the projector or controller, and the dragon will breathe fire, making her think that she is cooking uh, the taco with her breath into the mask. When she gets five breaths, uh, the dragon eats the taco and then grows into a bigger dragon. They do it over and over again. Meanwhile, we are giving her laughing gas and uh, stronger anesthetics to fall asleep unbeknownst to her. If she does smell the anesthetic, then we just tell her that it's the burning taco or the burning pizza or rocket fuel. We use our imaginations. Uh, this is just some old uh, internal data that showed that we had a decrease in the usage of oral midazolam, which is an oral uh, benzodiazepine to help kids relax uh, after implementation of this. And uh, we had a, like a slight bump in our likelihood to recommend scores after we implemented the birth system in our perioperative period. Um, that's just another example of uh, how we can do this. Micro Batman Lego game, and we've synced it uh, with the steering wheel to add another element of immersivity. It's actually adding the, the steering wheel. It's been uh, real, really. Uh, I don't know, the kids love the steering wheel. So. Um, we've done this in the ICU. We have lots of uh, protocols that we've developed through kind of, uh, I would say, expert opinion and clinical data and uh, a little bit of trial and error. We go down to about six years old. That's a common question. Uh, we will go slightly younger if, if we feel like the benefits far outweigh the risks. 
Uh, this is a video of a young girl having a, a small surgery on her arm. She's completely awake. I think she's only about seven years old at the time of this. And you can see uh, she's done this procedure three times now with just virtual reality, no uh, anesthesia. And this is a paper that we just recently got accepted for publication, a case series of, an, of 24 kids who went underwent uh, self, small similar procedures. Uh, all of which were successful. I think only one patient said they would, didn't want to do it uh, again uh, with just virtual reality. Uh, but all of the procedures were successful. All the kids went home immediately. This is some re retrospective data from our usage in our hospital, uh, which was published uh, maybe a year or two ago, showing that kids seem to get much less uh, side effects uh, than, than what's reported in adults. And again, this is using... Uh, customized software typically or, or carefully screened software and, and screening protocols but uh, we only had one out of 200 kids get dizzy uh, when appropriately screened and the most common side effect which is by far the most kind of common side effect with virtual reality in kids is uh, that a small percentage do get anxious when you put the headset on and they can't see what else is going on around them we kind of prep them by telling them to close their eyes or, and take the headset off if, if they do uh, they do feel worse. And here you can see who's actually using this on a day-to-day -day basis in, in our hospital. Uh, it, it's uh, a variety of age groups, but uh, mostly, you know, a little bit more common in the teenage age group and slightly more common uh, with uh, male patients than female patients and other patients. Where is virtual reality primarily being used in our hospital? Um, primarily in perioperative, that's kids who are getting procedures, but you can see it's being used all over. Um, here's some cool modifications and examples of procedures. This would be a nasal endoscopy where someone's sticking a camera down a kid's nose to look at their vocal cords while they're awake. This kid's playing Pebbles the Penguin. Uh, this shagged out version, it's an old version which is for a kid with a horrible skin condition. This is me uh, practicing with a topicalization protocol to, to do it. And esophagoscopy it was not fun. Um, here's augmented reality. This kid's getting prepped for uh, MRI. So they're doing a simulation of an MRI before they actually do their MRI. Um, we've done, we published a paper doing VR for epidurals uh, in pregnant patients. We don't really do it for laboring patients for a variety of reasons. Doesn't work for everything, virtual reality. Pretty good for blood draws, pretty good for kind of minor procedures. But if you're talking about uh, pushing out a baby or, or a severe trauma, uh, virtual reality alone is not going to get you through that. So there, I think there is a sweet spot for virtual reality in terms of how of when to use it for getting through a procedure. I'm going to show this final video of a young girl um, doing our physical therapy. Uh, Vive. Uh, this girl previously couldn't even stand uh, because she had such severe debilitating pain in her leg. And once we started doing this game with her, along with a multidisciplinary uh, team and a lot of other interventions, uh, this was a helpful tool for the physical therapy and the occupational therapy team in order to distract her from the pain and incentivize her to uh, start using her foot again. And we do this uh, regularly with uh, appropriate chronic pain patients. I'm going to end the show and take questions because I only, I think I'm almost out of time. So uh, I'm closing out my window and I'm going to click on this thing and here I am. And I'll look through the chat and I can stick around for a few more minutes. Um, so let's see. Noah's there. Thanks. Wonderful program. Awesome. We have Chariot at my hospital. Great to see some of the history, excellent spectrum of immersivity, getting kudos from Walter, and awesome. Are you familiar with the generally tolerated dose of VR for clinical scenarios? That's a great question. Um, so I can tell you the typical duration of uh, VR usage for a procedure is under 10 minutes probably because the most common procedure that we're using virtual reality for is for blood draws, IV, uh, insertion, vascular access. Um, 
we do have kids use it for up to 45 minutes uh, an hour uh, for things like wound care, dressing changes, pick line placement, and it they do well. Um, we have kids who use it like that are stuck in the intensive care unit for days and days and weeks sometimes and they're bored and they have nothing else to do. So we will let them use that for, um, you know, spurts of 20 minutes to or, or more for multiple times a day if, if they want to because uh, they have nothing else to do except watch TV. So this is a fun, you know, distraction just from their environment. Um, but typically, typically it is around 10 minutes uh, up to an hour. And I hope that is what you mean by dosage. I'm, I'm referring to duration. I guess with dosage, you could talk about intensity too. Um, we don't typically do super intense stuff for an hour if we're doing virtual reality experience with, with most of our pediatric patients. So if I was going to do it for an hour, um, I might do something that was a little bit more stimulating, more cognitively demanding initially for like the first 15 to 20 minutes and then switch them over to something more passive. Or we might even put them into like a movie in the VR headset. So I know that's not technically virtual reality. It would be more like video goggles. Um, but that would be an example of how we would do that uh, in an actual clinical situation. Are you also using general games or specifically designed games? So we, yeah, we do three things. Um, we use uh, stuff that we build uh, uh, in-house or with, with, with or contract developers. And that's very expensive and time consuming. And we do that. And those games are pretty good. Um, there are some groups that have customized games for us uh, that like an existing game. Uh, Dream Flight would be the most uh, 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 successful example that we've had with this, which was designed by Multiverse. It's a simple game where you're flying around on a paper airplane. And uh, they we asked them, we said, hey, this is our kids love this. Uh, would you be willing to make some modifications to it for our uh, our hospital and, and for kids to use and they said sure so they got rid of the menus they made it so it auto played and uh, so it was customization of existing uh, an existing game and then finally we do screen off the shelf games there's fantastic ones out there um, we use beat saber and physical therapy all the time uh, we use tilt brush all the time in physical therapy and there are some i don't know if you saw with the projector but the the Lego micro Batman game is just, it's perfect for that projection unit pairing with a steering wheel. And it's, we couldn't have just built anything that awesome. So uh, we do use off the shelf games that we've carefully screened. Um, and we do use uh, games that uh, we build in house or have customized. And Perfect. So yeah, Noah is commenting on, for one thing he says is typically if a user gets uh, seasick, car sick, they're at high risk for VR sickness. Exactly. We screen for that. Uh, we, when we approach, we, even before we approach a child and offer them or a patient say, you know, oh, would you like to do VR for this? We would ask them um, if they've ever tried it before, um, if they do get really seasick, because we don't want to offer a kid virtual reality and then find out, oh, this kid gets super seasick and now we've offered them a headset and they can't use it. And now they're crying because they're going to have surgery or a procedure and they're crying because they can't have a VR headset. So we tend to do the screening subtly before we even uh, offer them the headset. Uh, and yes, there is a variety of patients. Some patients can tolerate flipping upside down in roller coasters in virtual reality. Um, a lot of people can't. I mean, I even get a little dizzy when there's alteration of the horizon or inversion in virtual reality. Um, and I, and I have a pretty high tolerance. So, and duration, heat from the headset, weight of the headset. Again, this varies, uh, you know, a six year old doesn't, might not be able to wear the headset for as long as uh, a teenager. So yeah, there, it is a complicated topic, just like uh, Noah is saying there. Do you involve children in development or design of games? Um, we do get feedback from children all the time and, uh, we know what kids like and yeah, we ask them for ideas. We tend to involve the child life therapists much more in than the actual children in development of games. So child life therapists are someone that are intimately related, involved with the, the chariot program, 
Um, uh, we've been, they've been a part of the chariot program since our inception. Uh, they're some of the main uh, implementers and utilizers of virtual reality and critical to, to our program and, and in most hospitals. So um, we tend to involve the child life therapists more so than the children. But when we are launching a game, we, we let kids use it and we, we do take their feedback. Uh, so I guess we do involve them, uh, yes. Um, let me see how many comments. Yeah, I can get these. Um, looks like Amiad Fredman, MD. Uh, in general, six to ten sessions is six to ten minute sessions is the average tolerated time. But I am also specifically looking to, at older populations, so that is certainly playing an effect. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, you can go much longer than six to ten minutes. I mean, we have ki kids who, who who. I mean, one kid who was doing wound care. He was doing it for like 45 minutes to 50 minutes a day. Um, and while he was getting dressing changes for a severe injury, he would have done it longer. He loved it. He was only about seven years old and he had no problem wearing the headset. So I don't think, uh, I think it's very variable in terms of how long people will tolerate it. And very young kids, sometimes they'll do it for a very long time. Has Stanford used VR to train nurses? Um, we do use virtual reality for some training, not specific to nurses. We do it for physicians, medical students, uh, pre-medical students, and we do augmented reality for some simulation stuff. It is very useful. Uh, we use a lot of 360 video for training. Um, we are starting to do some more simulation it is a growing field. There's lots of opportunity there. So I think it is VR, augmented reality. Uh, th these are promising tools for training in healthcare. Um, sweating into the headset. <laughs> yes, uh, sweating into the headset is, uh, is occasionally a problem. Most of the kids, you know, I work primarily uh, in the inpatient setting. Uh, and even in the outpatient setting, when we're doing virtual reality, our kids tend to be, uh, um, I don't want to say sicker, but they're not, they're not doing very vigorous exercise. So I think a 20 minute session in physical therapy or occupational therapy in a headset is, is, is realistic. And that's typically what we would do 15 to 20 minutes. And the exercise does get mild, I would say mildly vigorous. Um, tilt brush is a good example of how people can spend more than a few minutes. Tilt brush is fantastic. And the intensity of tilt brush can change. Our, our therapists will um, have kids do tilt brush uh, sometimes as an introduction because they can just sit down and, and do very small hand motions uh, and draw. And then they can graduate up to getting up and walking around and building a bigger uh, virtual scene. Uh, they can make them squat down to the floor or reach up to the ceiling with tilt brush. So they can alter the intensity uh, pretty easily in tilt brush. And that's why a, a very, it's a very promising. How young is the youngest patient to use virtual reality? Uh, typically we go down to about six years old. Uh, we have gone younger. Again, with any intervention, there's risks and benefits. I think the risks of using virtual reality in a limited capacity in a supervised setting are very, very small. So I, I know we have had five-year-olds do it uh, when they were typically, it would be someone who was having wound care uh, uh, that was very, very scared and, and, and liked games. So um, I would say five is, is kind of as young as we go. Uh, younger than that, I guess it depends on their side. They, they start to have problems fitting the headset on them. And, and they might have problems following instructions, but our guidelines typically suggest around six years old. How does VR work for procedures where the children need to follow instructions during the procedure compared to procedures without needing to follow instruction? Excellent question, Lisa. Um, I don't know if you saw in any of our videos, but we almost always do this without headphones. That's why we like the headsets that, uh, I mean, if you were to look at not that I'm endorsing anything, but the, you know, the Oculus Quest 2 or the Oculus Go, uh, the audio is, is good for us because they don't have to wear headphones. 
they can hear the game and then they can hear us talking to them. So we typically do coach them through the procedures um, and we solicit verbal feedback because it can be harder to re read facial expressions while someone is, uh, is wearing a headset. So um, we, we are talking to them uh, during the procedure. And uh, um, I would say there's very few procedures where, where they don't need to follow instructions. This instruction may just be be still, um, but that is a, something that they may need to be reminded of uh, over time. Do you think there might be an application for multiplayer games for immunocompromised patients in isolation wards to mitigate social isolation? Brian, absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, I, I do, I, I do think there's potential. Um, I think the barriers for that are primarily from a implementation protocol standpoint. Uh, it's hard to uh, coordinate those activities, um, monitor those activities uh, uh, in the clinical setting. But I do think that is, is, is a promising application and, and uh, you know, we're starting to toy with it and play with it in some limited capacities. Um, Walter made a comment on uh, training and I don't know, are there any other questions? I'll go to the QA thing. There's a couple more here. XR applications. Are you aware of some good for sand tray therapy last year? Um, I'm not familiar with sand tray therapy, uh, Jonathan. Um, I don't know if that's a type of exposure therapy, but uh, I don't. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Commercial viability in hospitals, that's something that everyone's been struggling with. Um, we are very intentionally a nonprofit group, both with the Stanford Chariot Program and the, uh, uh, and the invincikids.org nonprofit that I work with because uh, we don't want to have to think about that or worry about that. Uh, it is hard to get hospitals to pay for this. The budgets are limited. Most of our money comes through philanthropy, through research grants. So I, I do see some commercially viable potential for it. I just don't know what the time frame for that is. And I'm too impatient. Um, so we raise money through, again, grants and, and philanthropy and, and try to move things forward uh, from a nonprofit standpoint as, as, as expeditiously as we can. How have you implemented the Quest 2? Are you using business model, consumer model with the unfortunate Facebook requirements? Um, excellent question. Um, I'm happy to, uh, you can email me and we can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it depends on, yeah, I mean, the recommendation would probably be to use the business model, but uh, I can talk about that offline if, if you would like, Marty. What it was the design decision behind using a projector system instead of a traditional screen? Um, I wonder about light affecting projection. Yes, light does affect projection. It is one of the biggest weaknesses of using a projection system is ambient light. Um, the reason we use a projection system rather than a screen is because we can't put a, so this is about a four foot screen, th between three and four foot screen that is mounted in terms of width to the foot of a stretcher a bed. We can't put a flat screen TV on a, on a bed that's wheeling through the hallway because it would fall uh, and it's too heavy and requires too much power and kids would break it. So that's why we do it. In stationary areas, like in, in, in the patient's room, for example, they could use a, a, just a regular flat screen TV, but they get wheeled around for procedures. Um, they go to environments where there might not be a TV. And uh, sometimes just the novelty of having a projector engages kids. So we can shine it on the wall, we can shine it on the ceiling, you know, when they're having their procedure beforehand. And, uh, you know, novelty does help a little bit. 
and that's with any type of technology, whether it's virtual reality or, or video games or anything. Uh, I'll go back to the chat for a few more minutes. Have you used this in telehealth environment? Mark, great question. That's basically what we've been working on. <laughs> and uh, Kate asked a similar, have you been able to use VR remotely? How did it work out during the pandemic? So yeah, I mean, that's what we've been working on for the last year um, is we, as part of our chronic pain team, um, as part of our chronic pain program, we were bringing kids in uh, probably once a week to do virtual reality physical therapy uh, in the clinic, in the outpatient clinic. And we couldn't do that anymore starting, I don't know, however long ago that was, a March ago, two Marches ago. Um, so we did transition to doing this remotely at home. And it did work well. There are a lot of hurdles and we are still working through them. Um, but how we have done it is we send a headset to the kid either via mail or they come pick it up. That's got, you know, the software we want on it, uh, whether that's our own or, or, uh, or commercially available stuff that they would use for their, their therapy. And then they would do a telehealth, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy session uh, typically with a, a parent or a supervisor in the room with them. They put on the headset and the therapist via telehealth will walk them through the same exercises that they were doing at home. Uh, again, there are some limitations. Uh, you, We can't really do, it's much more difficult to do mirroring of the headset. So we can't really see what the kid is seeing uh, uh, very easily. Uh, which is useful because we can give them feedback. Oh, click on that balloon, you know, kick that balloon or great job with that or oh, look at how your score is. So we, we kind of have to assume that uh, either have intimate knowledge of the game they're playing or, or uh, I guess the parent could do uh, screen mirroring if they, they were tech savvy enough because uh, most times you have to be on the same Wi-Fi uh, network to be able to do the, the, the mirroring or the casting. Um, and then, so they, they'll do a variety, they'll do their regular therapy sessions with VR as a tool for the session, uh, at home. And then when they are done, when they've done their, their, uh, their treatments, uh, they will either mail it back to us or they will bring it to a follow-up appointment at their, uh, at the clinic and we will process it for use with another patient, which means cleaning it. If there were any disposables, uh, whether they were face pads or straps, uh, we would replace those and we would send it to the next patient. Um, but, you know, we were going from using primarily the HTC Vive, which we had outfitted a room with uh, for therapy to having to do this now on mobile devices and we're still transitioning some of the software over from the HTC Vive to the mobile devices. And, and there, there are limitations in terms of what you can do on a mobile device. Uh, I mean, all, like, yeah, an all-in-one device uh, versus the HTC Vive. Um, for the HTC Vive, we had very advanced, we, we still do have very advanced capabilities, being able to track movement on each extremity. Over time, we can graphically represent that and use that for... Uh, incentivizing the patients, showing them progress or, or for research. Um, now taking that and going to something like, uh, uh, you know, an all-in-one headset is, again, we are going to get less, less, uh, less data, less accurate data, but it might not be that important. Um, you know, we can still get cumulative movement from the all-in-one headset, uh, which may be enough to say, hey, they're moving more. Um, we can show that the patient, you know, to demonstrate that they're moving more, we can use that in research studies. Um, I'm going to go down to, we are sending mobile VR headsets to children and family before they arrive at the hospital. And this is from Alan Olson or or Teco. Um, they come with therapies to reduce their stress before they arrive, uh, for medical procedures. This is fantastic. Um, 
And yes, I love that. And we have piloted that with uh, like a virtual tour. I think we, uh, we did that with before we built a new hospital. So um, I guess it doesn't apply to the new hospital anymore. And uh, um, but that's that's great. Uh, you know, being able to expose certain kids to the environment beforehand via virtual reality uh, uh, is is. Yeah, I think I can reduce stress in a lot of kids. And there, there's a lot of research behind um, how you orient kids and families to the hospital beforehand. I see uh, Jonathan is talking, he sent a link to Cleanbox. Um, Cleanbox is uh, a UV uh, box uh, that you can put headsets in to clean them. We currently only use the Cleanbox in one clinical site, and that is in our stem cell unit. Uh, where we want to be extra, extra uh, uh, infection control conscious. The clean box uh, will, for the most part, sterilize m most surfaces. Uh, it, it probably doesn't get into nooks and crannies. Um, it doesn't, probably doesn't do a great job on soft, any soft material. We replace everything with kind of wipeable stuff. Um, but uh, we do not use clean box as a replacement for wiping headsets down with hospital grade uh, wipes. So we use it maybe as an added bonus in somewhere where we are very, very worried about infection control. On patients who are who may have particularly nasty bugs or on isolation precautions, again, we're always weighing risk and benefits. Um, for those patients, we may choose not to use a headset, um, but if we really do feel like they will benefit, uh, I, I personally like to switch to disposables. So switching to a disposable face pad, disposable strap um, is my preference. If we can't do that, um, then yes, we do just are extra diligent about wiping it down again with hospital grade uh, wipes. Uh, the lenses, you know, it says not to wipe them down with uh, alcohol-based wipes. We have done it. We do do it with alcohol-based wipes frequently, and we haven't had too many problems, although I can't guarantee that you won't. Uh, we do switch to the hydrogen peroxide wipes to do the lenses primarily when, we, when they're available, and I think those are supposed to be slightly better. Um, so, yes, I can we can talk about infection control all day, but... Uh, it is very important. We, it's something we have been one of our main focuses basically since the inception of our program because the headsets used to be, you know, primarily like much softer and much more cloth. And, you know, if you looked at the Google Daydream, it was just, it was like a Petri dish. It was just covered in cloth. And, um, <laughs> so fortunately, the new, the new Quest is, is, is a little bit easier to wipe. You do have to switch some things out, but... Uh, uh, um, yes, if there's any other infection control questions, you can send me a message, email me, or and I'll do my best to, to let you know what we do. Have you had any experience with patients using gaze control on headsets versus controllers? Uh, this comes up all the time. We just don't have the patience to do gaze control. Um, I can see how it would be useful. There are definite scenarios uh, where gaze control would be useful. You know, you have kids who have IVs and lines or injuries to both arms and they can't even hold a, a controller. Um, you have scenarios where they need to have their head still. So, you know, we don't use ours in MRI, but, uh, you know, if, if they were having a procedure near their face or, or on their head or scalp, we have done those things like that. You don't want them, you know, looking back and forth. Uh, you want them to just control things with eyes. Gaze control, I think, would be useful. We just substitute a controller with those. The most common scenario that we actually do that we don't want kids moving their heads is when I showed a picture of doing the nasal endoscopy. They're taking a camera, they're looking in the kid's nose, back uh, into their pharynx to look at the vocal cords, and uh, you can't have the kid moving their head all around. So most uh, some of the games that we've designed will switch over between controller mode and uh, you know head movement mode. Uh, for control uh, with just a click of a button. So 
I do see gaze control having some utility. We just we just don't do it right now. Yeah. And uh, yes, let me see if there are any other questions that popped up. I think I've addressed most things in the chat. Last chance for any questions or I'm going to leave. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time. I'm going to sign off.